I think the division of countries such as Tahiti or the Cook Islands or New Zealand, it's really divided because of how we're colonized. And so British came into New Zealand, you know, America came into Hawaii, and French went into Tahiti, but we really are the same people. We're all Polynesians because our language are similar, our cultures are similar, our gods, lots of similarities. So the ocean is a big highway for us. You know, we're not afraid of it. It's just an extension of who we are. And the sun, yes, sets over the ocean and rises over the ocean. And I chose this slide here because Laka is the goddess of creativity and um, her sister is Pele. And as today, this slide was taken, this picture was taken within the year. She is still creating land. And so we're an ongoing creation in our place. This is on the big island and the lava flow is flowing to the ocean. This is in the Uhuli Valley in Haena, which is my island. And you can tell by this slide that the mountains are older because they're pointy. These are terraces that we grow our crops in. And when you go into the mountains and see a lot of terraces, you know that it was highly populated. So this is who I am. I choose to be a Native Hawaiian visual artist first. And by me saying that, then I'm setting up a preference of what I prefer to be. You know, I could be just a visual artist or I could be just an artist, but I choose to be Native. And that sets up a ground for how I work and the foundation of how I work. I just so happen to be a professor. That wasn't like a choice. You know, I'd rather be an artist. <laughs> and I work at Kamakuku Kalani Center for Hawaiian Studies. This is our building here on the top slide. And when you go to behind that building, that's looking back at it. And we have these huge gardens that we run our courses in. So if you come to... Um, the University of Hawaii. Well, let me go down the thing. Our school falls under Hawaii Nui Ake, which is the School of Hawaiian Knowledge. And in this school, we have language. We also have our gardens. So we run classes outside in, in the gardens so they learn how to cultivate in relationships to plants because they are everything that grows, we have a connection to. And they fall under some gods. The program I work under is called Halao Laka, and that program, I used to teach in the art department in fiber arts. Well, my MFA is in ceramics. I haven't done ceramics for a while. And I uh, taught in printmaking and fiber arts, surface design, textiles, and weaving. And when the Center for Hawaiian Studies asked me to shift over to their department, it was because we were creating a program a Native Hawaiian um, creative practice for because the way we create has different aesthetics and different foundations and we critique it different. Now this word here, Native Hawaiian creative practice, we went through many words with discussion <coughs> with Maoris and different um, Native artists. We first started off with Native Hawaiian visual language because art is a visual language. Then we went into um, creative expression because that allowed for poetry. Because a creative expression is the same concept, it, you just choose your media that you're going to do it in. But I thought that it would be important to include practice because to just talk about it is not enough. You have to practice it, you have to be hands on, and you have to touch it and do it. So now we're, for this year, we're in um, creative practice. And we're located at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I put this information there, so if you come to Hawaii, you can shoot me an email. And then, you know, we can get a little tour, you know, of our area, because it's quite unique, I believe. So, as um, Cynthia said, which was very interesting how to hear Hawaiian with a Native American accent. <laughs> it's a little different there, but it was pretty good. <laughs> so... Ikea Manama. I came up with this um, thought because this is a cultural concept, and when it, which is different from what we think about in Western thinking, because our ancestors actually, because they come before us, stand in front of us, and 
the future is behind us because it comes after us. And when we stand firmly in present day, our eyes in the past, we can move into the future. And through ourselves, we see our ancestors in us, and in our ancestors, we see ourselves. So when we, even our navigators who are taking those big canoes that are sailing through the Pacific, when they navigate their canoes, they stand and steer facing backwards from where they came, and they figure out the angles that way to move forward. And so just as we navigate through life, as Native people, it's important for us to actually be mindful of where we come from, because then it helps us when we move into the future to be much more successful at it. These are some questions I ask, and these slides, I'll explain the picture, because I also thought, being here in Santa Fe, that people weren't familiar with some of our cultural practices. And so how thin is the veil between the past and present? These are bark cloth, they're over 200 years old. This is our fabric, we didn't have looms so we never wove. And this is what we wore as clothing, blankets, used as the material, and it comes from a tree, it's pounded out. The top slide on the left is a surface design, all natural dyes, and you know, close-ups at the bottom. And then each of the uh, couple pieces that differs from other Polynesian couple pieces has a watermark. And so there's this pattern that is beaten into the kapa that gives it another dimension. It's sort of like lace-like, where no other um, culture has done that, even in Polynesia, like Tahitians or Samoans or Tongans. You know, that which is, what is it, that which is traditional or contemporary, and I'll speak about those words. And this piece is a basket. I put my friend in there because, just for scale, because it's a huge wow. basket. And this is from Aerial Roots uh, Twined, EAEA, and this piece is at the Peabody Museum in Salem. And what are the many layers? As natives, where do we exist? Especially presently in this time. And this is a fan that actually no one knew how to weave. And we have a young weaver who works at the museum, the museum, who has re... What's the word here? He didn't rediscover, but he brought back, because he was such a good weaver, he brought back this fan, and he can now weave this. So the black area of this fan is human hair, and the top is plated, and the bottom part is twined. I don't think it served a function so much as cooling yourself off. I think it was a prestige kind of item that the kings or the queens used. And do we exist on the surface? This is our mats. It's made out of a reed from um, water, fresh water. It's called makaloa, and patterns are woven in. And do we exist in between or within? These are our feather capes, that these feathers are uh, tied on a net, foundations of net, a, a tiny eyed net. When worn, though it doesn't quite look like this, you know, the design will change when it's on a human body. Also, each one of these capes have a different design, so that when your leader or king, commonly East wore them, chiefs wore them, then you would know where they were standing, especially in battle. If the chief had his cape on and was fighting, you knew your chief was still standing, because you could see this flashing in the distance. So the designs were not um, duplicated. There was only one design for each chief. Hundreds, thousands of feathers. Okay, there's a whole other talk about how these are made. You know? <laughs> they had to catch the bird, they didn't kill the bird, they just plucked the feathers. And these are our images. You know, do we exist below the surface or above the surface? We have uh, thousands of gods. And our gods represent different things within our society. So if it's war, 
the time of war happens, and that's the God of Ku, and Ku will come out into the temple, and prayers will be given, so he will have power. But when time of peace came, Ku would go back into the temple, and Lona would come out at the time of peace, and everybody who was a prisoner or in hiding would be Noah. And in the chant I did, you know, there, at the end of it I had Noah, because I had to unrestrict the couple, you know, lift the couple, and we we do a lot of those kind of ceremonies. So so to unsacredness, sacred the things, you know, the time or the thing. So these images do not have any power if there's no prayers placed on it. So for common understanding, I wanted to look at these words, being the teacher that I am, and so. We have been rethinking how we use the word traditional because as our friend here, Jim James Scroper, the first people says the evolution of the native art was interpreted by European colonization that the current definition of traditional is an arbitrary selection of a single development stage. Where, what is traditional? You know, what period of time is that? So, what we do today, in 50 years, will that be traditional within our culture? So now we use the word, I only use traditional if my audience understand how I use it. So we use customary creative practices because anything that our ancestors did are customary. And we continue that practice today in what we do. This piece here is a couple piece close up with the watermarks. <coughs> It looks very contemporary to me, but it's over 200 years old. And our all our designs have a name. This is a fishnet with a little shell in the middle. And then what is contemporary? Contemporary is something that is current and in this time. So, the insider view is that contemporary Maori or indigenous art must be defined culturally and holistically in terms of comprehensiveness and inclusiveness within the indigenous conceptual framework. Um, I made this piece, I'm a couple maker as well, and this piece is in the collection at Te Papa Museum in Wellington, New Zealand. Oh. It's about eight feet by four feet, I think. And it's all natural dyes. There's about 16 different plant dyes in this piece. So we're actually bringing back some of our practices where this practice, a whole generation, no one practiced this. So museums have helped us, or collections have helped us to rediscover what those processes are. So I really value those you know, collections that we have references to. And then in Hawaii, because we're such a tourist sort of trade there, and lots of people say they do Hawaiian art, when you just say Hawaiian art, we're saying um, that it is a, from a view of one who thinks of what Hawaii is. Or it's Hawaii themed, or sense of place theme. It's from perspective of the artist, usually non-native. And there's damage control because there's this romantic um, notion of what Hawaii is like. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it is what the culture practices. So, such as this picture that comes out of the 40s, and this is a menu, Matson menu, when the boats used to come into Hawaii. And they, you know, this is a romantic notion. And, but the damage control is that we don't really behave this way. You know, we don't have parties like that. <laughs> so it, it, it changes history if one doesn't speak up about it. I think. Okay, did I not? Yeah. So um, we say that, so we put Native Hawaiian, so I have to say I'm a Native Hawaiian artist because I have genealogy. And I choose to define, choose to reference cultural value and knowledge in my work. And I choose to be de de defined as such. And there's some artists that do not, and that's okay too. You know, if you're going to do the art of business, then you got to put it out there and that's good. But you have to articulate that, I believe. 
this piece is a piece I've done, it's textile, and I do a <coughs> technique called Deborah, which is burnout. And so this piece are two panels that run about 12 feet by two feet. And I burnt out the words Ola, which is O-L-A, which means life. And then on the other panel, it has our um, Okina, or that mark, <laughs> I don't know what you call it in English. And it's O-L-E, which means Ole, which means a negative. So we have these two words that look exactly alike, but they're totally opposite. But the thing that I like about this is it's off the wall. So actually the piece is on the wall. It's the shadow on the wall. It's like the writing on the wall. So historically, we Native Hawaiians do not separate our creations into art, artifacts, or culture. For us, creativity supersedes such clarifications. Native treasures, now admired as art, were originally created for practical purposes and were also associated with mana, which is power. And we are such power um, grabbers. We try to get as much money as we can. And kapus, highly valued or restricted. Or mo'okuaha, which is genealogy. And genealogy is really important for us. And this is a piece I did. It's prints. And I started to do digital work. And so I'm, um, the prints are all fishnets, different sized fishnets. And it's the eyes of the net. But then projected on Every 10 seconds, a new set of eyes show up on these nets. And so it's sort of like the watchdogs of culture. Carved canoes, paddles, weapons, agricultural tools, musical instruments, personal adornments, clothing, basketry, fishing gear often become beautiful works of art. Images, symbols, designs, and motifs give an insight into the native Hawaiian essence of life. I also made this piece, it's a, this is a funny story because this piece on the left, that's how it started off, with, that way, and then never take your art to a gathering of natives. Because when it comes time for gifting, then my art started to, you know, I had to like give away my pieces, and then this, and then ended up, I didn't have that much left. <laughs> and then this piece actually went to Changing Hands, number two, that was in New York. And... It is actually, each individual piece is a shark's tooth knife. That we, it's a utility knife that we use for cutting. And I think you can kind of see the teeth, you know. But I was thinking about how do we take our everyday forms and our things that we take for granted and change the landscape of that and change the function. Because actually that's what we're doing as today, you know, when we take those references and stick it into our art today. Today, Native Hawaiian artists are still creating traditional art, while contemporary Native Hawaiian artists are developing innovative new techniques, materials, and themes within the style handed down by their ancestors through the generations. And we believe, as in any culture, that the artist is a custodian of culture with obligation as well as privileges. So me saying that I'm a Native Artist means that I have responsibilities that I have to take care of. And this piece was in a show last year. It's an installation. I do a lot of installation work. And this is the front part is um, stainless steel strips. I'm sorry, aluminum strips that I wove. And I didn't finish the basket purposely because we are like the vessel. And we're not finished yet. We're still growing. And the back is these baskets that remain more of the material that we normally make baskets to create this spiral. And spiral for us is life, you know, expanding, the beginning of life, expanding. So this room was pretty big, I think 20 by 20. I love installations. And in here, I'm not going to read because everyone can read. But this lists all the different things we do, you know. We carved using wood, bone, and stone. We did fiber. We did feather work. Today we do all the new medias, we do jewelry, and like any other culture, you know, we're adapting and evolving. This piece here, I collaborated with a Maori artist, and she wove the corset out of harakeke, which is a flax. 
and did the jury piece, and I did the burnout velvet, and I burnt into it a chant that had to do with the ocean, because it sort of had that ocean look, and it was about an ocean uh, theme. I also do, so now we're going into textiles, because it's the fun girl thing, and <laughs> I also do designs for um, hula performances. Our dances were very big in Hawaii. So I designed their designs on the costumes. And the bottom right, the top, the three, with the students in it, is Kalimia Schools. And they do a performance every year on a theme. And the bottom right is a hula group that competes, we have a big um, hula competition called Mirror Monarch with like 26 different hula schools. That's a good time to visit Hawaii if you want to see hula. It's about April. And I did all their textiles for their dresses. I also have a fashion line that I do out of silk and velvet. And I think, I mean, I show these because my motifs or designs really go through, they'll appear in the glass, actually. And last week I was in Hawaii. I went back for this fashion show, and this is the line of clothing that I did for it last week. And they're all silk. Fun. <laughs> Had lots of fun. You know, get your nails painted, <laughs> put on more makeup than you need. <laughs> so the artist role. I saw this little saying um, in one of, I think, the University of Washington's art department. And I really believe, as an artist, this is, for, but for me, I mean, I, I guess I have to speak for myself, because I really didn't decide to be an artist. I just was, you know, I, I just, when I was a kid, I seemed to get all the art kits for Christmas gifts, and my brothers and sisters didn't, you know, and my art was taped to the walls, you know, my parents probably saw that, and it was very nice for them to see that. But you feel a passion to create and a belief in what you have to say. And I think key in that one is you have to believe. And you need to express that belief to others and a desire to communicate visually. So visual language, you know. We people write books, artists do it visually. This piece was in that show in Astoria, um, Oregon, I think in April. And this is ceramics and then I wove the head piece. And I'm showing faces because we're coming into the glass and my glass has faces in it. So artists are oft, often considered cultural bearers and when you hear some, when you bear something it implies a burden or responsibility. And we need to recognize the native cultural practitioner as a scholar and expert in their field. Um, this piece is fiber, pulp, paper pulp. And it is faces of maybe I cast faces of students and made this cape. Indigenous art stems from the land, from heritage, and from shared experiences. It acts as a type of emotional intelligence and has the capacity to enrich the wider world by being, bringing balance and more fundamental sense of perspective. This piece, I was commissioned to do a piece for Hawaiian Hall at Bishop Museum. And what happened when they renovated that museum was they felt that with the artifacts that they should also have contemporary artists mixed in. So that, that it shows, I don't know, artifacts is not a very good word because it shows, when you just say artifacts, then we're really a dead culture. But we're a, a continuing culture. We're not dead. And so they felt that it was important to put contemporary work within the old pieces so this relationship would develop. We grew up as natives always hearing that our elders, we must listen to our elders for knowledge. And as an artist, I also feel that these older pieces are also elders. And sometimes these pieces speak and we learn from it. And so our pieces also are with, maybe these pieces have to speak to each other, the old and the new. So when they asked me to do this piece, they gave me a theme, and my theme was creation of man. And then they gave me a couple of stories about 
Hawaiian stories of creation, but I didn't feel that I wanted to be so specific because we have four different kind of creation stories. And I thought, well, in man we reflect our ancestors, so that whole statement that I read before really speaks to this piece. So, you know, there's the contemporary material faces, and then there's the old material, the cup on the back of faces. And when you look through the glass, you can see the old, and the old comes through the glass, so it's a two-way thing, we reflect each other. So that was that idea. But what I learned from this commission was I was not a glass artist, and I had to hire a glass artist who took 80% of my commission. <laughs> then I thought, oh, I'm going to learn this, because it doesn't seem that hard, you know? And so what has happened with this is, I kept thinking about that, and that's, here at SAR, I continued this idea. So process. I'm a printmaker. I taught printmaking, mainly relief printing and screen printing. So when I first came into Santa Fe, I had to pack it up, bring it in, and I think the first two weeks, I was trying to make screens. I found a system that you just needed one metal piece, a frame, and then I can pop my screens in and out, and you'll see that in my studio. Uh, my challenge was that I didn't bring emulsion with me because I didn't want to pack liquid on the plane. So I had to find some place to buy emulsion, and I got some emulsion from Albuquerque, and I could not figure out how to use it. You know, my success rate was maybe 20%. Very frustrating. Plus, your sun is different. So like in Hawaii, maybe my exposure time would be 30 seconds, and here it's like 10. <laughs> so intense. So, you know, I had to figure that out. You know, I'd be washing emulsion off, recoding, going back, trying again and again. And finally, after two weeks, I just couldn't get the emulsion part, so I just called Hawaii. They shipped it in. The shipping was twice as much as the product, you know, but I could at least work. So then I started to build screens, and once I got the screens, I could do, I had images. Then I screened glass frit onto sheets of clear glass. And I had to work out that technique because I didn't, it was experimental, and figure out how that happened, how to stack glass powders onto glass, also to close the studio door so the wind won't blow the glass, the powders <laughs> off the glass, you know? And so, and how to mix color, because I didn't want to use color straight out of the bottle. And how to layer it up, you know, so screen certain colors and then layer another one on top. <clears throat> then I had to learn, as soon as I came in, I bought a kiln from Bullseye, because I did ship that in with me. Then I had to learn about firing this kiln, and that took a little bit too. You know, so there's a big range, and so, I was doing, and I'll go into each one, I was doing a tack fuse firing, I was doing a fuse, a full fuse firing, and a slump beam firing. This is the little kiln, which I'm going to take home. <laughs> I was going to let it go, but I think, oh, I'm going to use this kiln. So tack fusing means that when you put the powder onto the glass, you need to take it to a certain temperature so that the powder melts or sits on the surface of the glass, not being a powder, so that now I can move it, you know, and things are not falling off. And that's important because when you're starting to stack the glass, you can't have powder between because it traps the air. So, each layer of glass fires for about 12 hours at these temperatures. Then, like the few, the full fuse, like the piece on the left, there is three layers of that tack fuse. And then I, glass likes to seek a height, a thickness of a fourth of an inch. So three layers of glass was higher than a fourth of an inch. So I had to dam the glass up so it wouldn't flow out, or else I had like these weird soft circles around my piece, and I wanted to keep my square. And so full fuse is at this temperature, and it takes about 22 hours. Then I had to create a mold. And I, thank goodness, I brought in a mask of my face. And then I pushed clay in it. 
made this box and poured plaster into it and created these molds that you see on the right. So for every piece, it had to have its own mold because after one firing, the mold falls apart. So I think I made 14 or 13 molds. I guess the point is it, it's a long process. <laughs> you know? And then you have to slump it into the mold. So this piece here on the left is three layers thick. Then I turn it so that the front of it is down to the mold, which is on the right, top right. This is what it looks like when it comes out of the kiln. You can see it falling into the face. And that's what it looks like on the right, with the face in it. I took two pieces into the show, Pacific Rim <coughs> in um, Oregon, and that's where I also learned about hanging. And so I wasn't quite sure how to hang the glass and the simple method of those L screws works really nice. How heavy would that be? Um, I would say about six pounds maybe. You can go lift it. <laughs> <laughs> and I also use images from my culture. So I used, you know, I screened a fern, which this is our fern here. We use it in our dances to make our lays. Um, this is a weaving here on the top, and this is a weaving I did at the bottom in our hats. So I used images that I was used to or familiar with. So the top left is at the bottom. You know, I have those limpet shells, and that's what it looks like on the rock. We eat those. It has a little muscle in it. It's called opihi. And then on the top right, that is a kappa motif of this, we call it fauna, sea urchins. So everything references something in nature. The triangles on the right actually is a tattoo symbol for sharks. So we believe in our families that we have guardian spirits that take up um, animal forms. And so those who have sharks in their family will probably have these tattoos. We're all big on. Tattoo actually comes from the word, the side trivia, <laughs> comes from the word kakao, which means to write. And um, tattooing in Tahiti, they use a T instead of a K, so they, they say tatao. And so when the sailors were coming through the Pacific and got tattooed and went back to the West, that's how tattooing started in the West. But in Polynesia, you know, tattooing is real big. There's always been, you know, all the men, or any women are tattooed. And normally it is, I have tattoos, and normally the person that does me, I don't ask for what I want. He, he gives me what I need. And they do a genealogy. Um, you have to know your genealogy a couple of generations back, and then they have the marks of your genealogy that goes on. Because I work in the university, he said I needed double, double protection. <laughs> And I like text in my work, so I put these, I screen these texts in, so you'll notice in all the glass pieces, they'll have this text, such as when I was doing, Aloha will keep us alive. Aloha means love. Well, it has many meanings. I was listening to the Eagles, you know that song. <laughs> and then um, Walker or Talker, there's a big thing in our culture. There's some of, you know, especially in academia, people talk a lot, but no one practices. <laughs> and little reminders. Also, if the people lead, the leaders will follow. Or are we a part of the solution or the problem? Because we are really big at the Center for Hawaiian Studies with sovereignty. You know, we need sovereignty. And everyone is a teacher. I really believe that. We have to pay attention. And then also, we walk upon the bones of our ancestors. So our land, you know, if we're here for generations and generations, it's the same here, you know. There are people that have been here for years and years and years. The bottom one, which actually observation without judgment, I'm trying to practice this one. It's a reminder for myself. And what's next for me is 
When I go back into Hawaii, I actually, in the middle of June, go to Tahiti for three weeks. I take in eight students. We are really big on cultural exchanges, native cultural exchanges. So there will be students coming in from New Zealand, Fiji, Samoa, and Tuomotus, you know, in different areas in Polynesia. And we stay for three weeks and do art. University students. And then I go into Portland in July for three days of Aloha doing a workshop in Kapa. I also go in as director of the center in August. I don't want to go in regretfully, but I sure like my sabbatical. <laughs> you know? I took a year off. It was great. And then we have a big um, Aha Wahine conference with a hundred, well not a hundred, a thousand Native Hawaiian women. So the men have their conference and they deal with men things. And then the women have their conference and we deal with women things. And this happens in August. Then I have a soul show at the end of the year. Then I go into another gathering in New Zealand. So we quite have a, you know, we have a busy schedule going. And thank you very much.